Thank you to Brother Josh for reading our scriptural text this morning, which came from the book of Luke. The chapter was 22 and the verses were 19 through 20. And it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, the Christian's Memorial Day. The Christian's Memorial Day. What is Memorial Day? Well, Memorial Day is an American holiday that all of us in this country will be celebrating tomorrow that honors the men and women who died while serving in the United States military. It was traditionally observed on May 30th annually, but now it is observed on the last Monday of May. It originated in the years following this country's Civil War as a day to decorate the graves of fallen soldiers with flowers and flags. It was originally called Decoration Day, but became an official holiday, an official federal holiday in 1971. Now, some of the Memorial Day traditions include visiting cemeteries or memorials, holding family gatherings, participating in parades, and having a moment of silence at 3 p.m. local time. Memorial Day also marks the unofficial start of the summer season in the United States. Now, I want us to think back to the month of April, that during Easter, we recognize that many sermons are proclaimed by gospel preachers reminding the audience of how Christians do not limit the celebration of Christ's resurrection to one Sunday out of the year. Whenever the unadulterated gospel is preached or shared, then the risen Christ is celebrated, especially weekly when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Well, brethren, the same can be said about Memorial Day. Every Sunday is a memorial day to the Christian when we come together to partake of the memorial meal commonly referred to as communion or the Lord's Supper. And so that brings us back to our scriptural text of Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. Listen to your Bible. Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 20, the Bible reads, And he, he being Jesus, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Here in this text, we have full directions for observing the Lord's Supper. We see what it was. It was unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. We see how it was done. We see that the Lord took bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples, explained what it symbolized and gave instructions on how to partake. Then he did the same for the fruit of the vine. The directions are plain. The directions are clear. The directions are definite. It will not be right to do something else. But we must, as Jesus says, do this. And we are to do this in remembrance of him. Therefore, this raises a question. And that question is, do we know him? Do we know him? Because in order for us to do something in remembrance of him, we must first know him. For whoever does not know him cannot 
remember him. And so I want us to just ponder this thought throughout this message. There's three points that I want to bring to your attention, and then the lesson is yours to respond to. Our first point is this. The Lord's Supper is a personal memorial. It is a personal memorial. Listen to the words of Jesus again. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Not anybody else, just him. Do this in remembrance of him. The Bible makes it clear that we are to remember not so much the Lord's doctrines when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Nor are we called upon to remember his precepts when we partake of the Lord's Supper. But Jesus says, when we come to partake of this memorial meal, what should be on our mind are not his precepts, not his commandments, not what he taught, but what he did. We need to be focused on his person. We're to remember what he did, who he is. Remember Jesus during the Lord's Supper as the trust of our hearts. We need to keep that in mind when we partake. We go back to the Old Testament where the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, Proverbs chapter 3, and the verse is 5. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, our hearts and our minds need to trust in the Savior. It needs to lean on on the Lord because he is the trust of our hearts if we can't trust anybody else when we partake of the Lord's Supper that is the moment that we need to be reminded that because of what he did for us there is somebody we can trust and the person we trust is him but not only that we need to remember Jesus during the Lord's Supper as the object of our gratitude. Why are we thankful? Why do we pray in the morning? Why do we come here every first day of the week and give him thanks? He is the object of our gratitude. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56 and 57. The Bible reads, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through who through our Lord Jesus Christ whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper we need to remember the fact that if it had not been for Jesus we wouldn't even be here to partake he is the reason why we get up in the morning. He is the reason why our souls are saved. And so if we thank God, we must thank him through Jesus because Jesus has to be the object of our gratitude when we partake of this meal. But not only that, we need to remember Jesus during the Lord's Supper as the Lord of our conduct. That means that he is the one that paid the cost to be the boss. He is the only one that gets to tell us what to do. And you can talk back if you want to talk back and find out who's in control. Because Jesus has to be the Lord of our conduct. He tells us what to think, what to speak, how to act. Because he died so that we can live. He paid a penalty so that we can stand before the Father debt free. Listen to your Bible. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3 verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, Jesus says do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is the Apostle Paul talking about how we must have the authority of Jesus for whatever it is that we do. And then he says, giving thanks to God the Father 
through this Jesus, according to Colossians 3.17. But then we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 as well, where he specifies eating and drinking. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, this is how you do it. Do all to the glory of God. When we partake of this memorial meal, do we remember that we're supposed to be acting a certain way? And if we are acting a certain way, is it because we are listening to the influence of Jesus or the influence of somebody else? And then we have to ask ourselves the question as well, when we are examining ourselves in the partaking of this meal, are we doing it for the glory of God? Because we are commanded to do all for his glory. But not only that, we must remember Jesus during the Lord's Supper as the joy of our lives. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. There's a song that says, Jesus, you are the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. Hope for all I do. Jesus. You're the center of my joy. That means that we can have joy even when we're not happy. We can have joy when things are not going our way. We can still have joy even after all the things we've been through. We can still have joy. And so we may have came here sad, but when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we should leave here glad because we need to recognize the fact that Jesus is still Lord. Jesus is still the joy of our lives. And we have nothing, absolutely nothing to be upset about. We need to remember Jesus during the Lord's Supper as, the represent, as our representative before God. As our representative before God. We have the best advocate, and he's doing this pro bono on our behalf so that when we stand before God in judgment, we got the best defense to be in glory with him forevermore. And this is what we learn through the reading of God's word. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2 and the verses 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you. For what purpose, John? So that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. You can't have a better advocate than someone who has never sinned and then stands before the Father on behalf of a sinner. And so we need to keep that in mind when we partake of the Lord's Supper. But not only that, we need to remember Jesus during the Lord's Supper as the rewarder of our faith, as the rewarder of our faith, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's what we learn in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Now, I am no prophet, but I will predict that there are some that have read some of these verses and have said, you know what, the context in some of that, Brother Holloway, is the Father. And so, therefore, I can't wait to talk to him after services to share with him that era of the verses that he has used. No, I want us to understand this morning that Jesus is God in the flesh, that they are co-equal in authority, that they agree. And so if we can trust in the Father, we can also trust in the Son. Isn't that what Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, verse 1? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Jesus said, also believe in me. And so we need to recognize the fact that everything God does for us is through the one he sent to die for us. And that is Jesus. 
And we need to keep that in mind whenever we come together on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. We need to remember who he was. He was the suffering servant that we read about in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. We need to remember who Jesus is. Jesus is the resurrected ruler. This is what Peter reminds the folks on Pentecost by saying this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. But not only do we need to remember who he was and who he is, but brethren, we need to remember who he will be. Jesus will be the just judge upon his return. Listen to Paul's dying words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. He says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not for me only, but for all them that love his appearing. We need to remember the Lord with full energy. We need to remember the Lord with concentration of thought. We need to remember the Lord with vividness. We need to remember the Lord with deep emotion. The Lord's Supper is a personal memorial. But not only is it that, but our second point this morning is that the Lord's Supper is a powerful memorial. It's a powerful memorial. By powerful, I mean it's striking. It is an extraordinary and beautiful memorial. Now, what makes this memorial powerful is its simplicity. When we read in Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, a verse that is constantly quoted and read whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26. We learn in that text that the emblems of communion are simple, <laughs> But not only are they simple, but they are like the Lord himself. And when we look at the Lord, we see that the Lord is transparent. That means that he is obvious and understandable. And when we partake of the unleavened bread, it is obvious and it is understandable. We also understand that the Lord himself is unpretentious. That means that he is modest and that he is humble. And whenever we partake of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, these simple emblems, we see the modesty of these emblems that he used to represent himself. Only bread is broken and only the fruit of the vine is poured out. But not only the simplicity makes this memorial powerful, but we also understand that the frequency is also what makes this memorial powerful. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, where the apostle Paul writes, for as often as, that means for as often as we do this, the more we do it, the more it's not supposed to become mundane, but the more we're supposed to draw closer to the one whom we commune with when we partake of this memorial meal. See, the fact that there is a frequency to it, it really speaks to our constant need to partake of it. By apostolic and approved example, Christians partook of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Not Saturday night. Not Christmas morning, not when somebody die, not on Thursday, not on Saturday. No, nope, the Bible tells us on Sunday, the first day of the week. 
And whenever the first day of the week arrived, we read by example that Christians did what the Lord intended, which was for the Lord's Supper to be often enjoyed by those washed in Christ's blood and saved by God's love. But not only is the simplicity and frequency is what makes this memorial powerful. But what makes this memorial powerful is its universality. Its universality as we see in Matthew chapter 26, verse 27. And I am embarrassed that I didn't even know this part for quite some time. See, I learned a lot of my verses in the King James Version of the Bible. And when you go back to Matthew chapter 26, verse 27, it reads, when it came to the fruit of the vine, Jesus says, drink ye all of it. And for years, I thought he was talking about the substance in the cup. So every time I look at my family, I said, now, Goy, you need to finish that. You need to drink all of that. Jesus said, drink ye all of it. And then all of a sudden, I decided to go to school. <laughs> and then I started to see that that's not what he was talking about. It's correctly translated, drink of it, all of you. So he's saying to his disciples at that moment, all y'all need to partake of this. All y'all need to be a partaker of my body and my blood. Nobody is left out. This shows the need of all. That in every land, wherever God has people, all of these people come together on the first day of the week to eat and to drink at this table. As we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, as well as verse 21, Christ's death is in and of itself the best memory of himself. And it is by proclaiming his death that we remember him. And we proclaim his death through the partaking of this memorial meal. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, we also need to recognize its power because Christ's covenant, which was established by the blood that he shed, is a great aid to memory. Remember, it was Jesus that said in the institution of this meal that this is the new covenant in my blood. And so whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, there's two individuals that we need to think about. We need to first think about our first Adam because through him, we inherited something called death. But because of the second Adam, who is Jesus, our Lord, we now inherit something called eternal life through his death. And we read about that in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Our receiving Christ is the best method of keeping him in memory. Therefore, we eat of his body and drink of his blood. No better memorial could have been ordained by our Lord. But not only is the Lord's Supper a personal memorial and a powerful memorial, but I want to conclude this morning by talking about how the Lord's Supper is a persuasive memorial. It is a persuasive memorial. Now, by persuasive, I mean inviting. It is an alluring and captivating memorial. We sing a song entitled, All Things Are Ready. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come, for the table is now spread. Come, for the door is open wide. Come, while he waits to welcome you. Come and leave every care and worldly strife. Yes, this is an invitation, but isn't this also the mindset that we're supposed to have when we come to commune with our Lord? My brothers and sisters, since we are invited to come to the Lord's table, that we may remember him, we may safely conclude that 
we may come to it, though we have forgotten him often and sadly. See, there's so many people that read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and talk about we need to partake of this in a worldly, wor worthy manner. Oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not going to partake. But yet Jesus invites you, if you're a child of his, to come and partake, even if you have forgotten him, sadly. See, in fact, this will be a reason for coming. For this reason, we must be faithful in our attendance to reduce the likelihood of forgetting his sacrifice in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. This is an appointment we cannot miss because it's through partaking of this memorial meal that we're supposed to go throughout the week and remember Jesus died for me. So I can't think those thoughts. Jesus died for me. I can't speak those words. Jesus died for me. I can't engage in these acts. Jesus died for me. I have to tell somebody about his story. Jesus died for me. So why should I feel discouraged? Jesus died for me. And if throughout the week we forget that, don't worry. If he hasn't come before next Sunday, come back and receive a reminder as to how good he is. You know, since we are invited to come to the Lord's table, that we may remember him, we may safely conclude that we may come though others may be forgetful of him. There's so many people that are so wrapped up in how the person sitting next to you hadn't been there for a minute, how could they partake? Or how the person next to them living, how could they partake? or what they saw them do last week and last night and last month looking across the room about let me see if they gonna partake. Look, this memorial meal is not about them. This memorial meal is about you communing with him. This is not a moment for us to come together and judge them. This Lord's Supper is all about him and us having fellowship with him. And I don't understand why certain Christians, pe certain people that are members of the church act that way when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Plate coming around, we ready to smack hands. You can't partake. I know where you was at last week. Come on, stop that. That's not what we're here to do. We don't do that in no other aspect of life. Don't you know those of us who are married? None of us would be married if we judged our spouses based upon who they were dating before you chose them. We wouldn't. My wife looked at some of my ex-girlfriends. She was just like, man, your life must have been rough. <laughs> that that's what you had to settle for before I came into your life. <laughs> And then sometimes I have to look at some old photos and I'm like, you used to date him. You must have been going through something. <laughs> but if I was to judge her based upon who she knew before she met me, we wouldn't be together. And if she was to judge me based upon who I knew before I met her, we wouldn't, she wouldn't even be with me. And so we need to stop doing that when it comes to the Lord's Supper. I'm going to change my membership. They let them partake. It's not about them. It's about him. And that's what we need to keep in mind. Since we are invited to come to the Lord's table that we may remember him, we may also safely conclude that we may come even though we are weak and weary from toil and trouble. Let this memorial meal remind us that God is still good, that Christ is still able, and that the Spirit is still willing. Whenever we partake of this Lord's Supper, 
We need to always remember and recognize that it will be sweet. It will be cheering. It will be sanctifying. And it will be quickening to remember him through this supper. Therefore, let us not fail to come and partake every first day of the week. Let us at the sacred table quit all other things. Let us not burden ourselves with the worries, troubles, and cares of this world, but let us muse wholly and only on him whose flesh is meat indeed and whose blood is drink indeed. Let this day be the day we never forget all that the Lord has done for us. So where do you stand this morning? You know, there's a song, as we already stated earlier, all things are ready, come to the feast. And so this is an invitation that if you are famished and weary, come and you will be richly fed. This is a place of honor reserved for you at the master's side. All you need to do is come. Delay not while the day is here. Why? For tomorrow may never be. Therefore, it's time for you to come. Come, feast on the love of God and drink everlasting life. That's what Jesus is inviting you to do at this very moment. You've heard God's word according to John 6, 45. Do you believe what it is that you have heard? Do you believe that Jesus is worth it? Do you believe that he has done all of this for you? Do you believe he died for you, was buried in a borrowed tomb for you? But do you believe that he got up early one Sunday morning and through his sacrifice and through his resurrection we have a chance we have a life we have hope because of him if so repent of your sins this morning stop entertaining yourself with the things that Jesus died for according to Luke 13 3 will you call upon him will you confess his name this morning according to Matthew 10 32 will you be baptized this morning and have your sins washed away will you die to sin be buried in this watery grave and raised to the newness of life just like Jesus died for you was buried in Joseph's new tomb but then he raised to the newness of life, to be Lord and Christ. Follow that pattern in that act. And when you do it Jesus' way, he will forgive you of your sins. According to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he'll make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, what kind of creature? A creature that now has something else to think about not just on Memorial Day weekend, but whenever we come together on the first day of the week to celebrate the true and authentic Memorial Day that was in place some 1,800 years before America even thought about it. And that is the memorial of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He stands ready to add you to his church, the only church that you could read about in scripture, and that church is the church of Christ. Jesus said he was going to build that church in Matthew 16, 18. He built that church in Acts chapter 2. He purchased that church with his very own blood, the blood we have been talking about on today. According to Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he asked to say to his church, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and that church bears his name according to Romans chapter 16, verse 16. Why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord, which does all that Jesus authorizes? And so if you are a Christian on this morning, you've already obeyed the gospel. You're a member 
of the church. I want you to hear the invitation. Come, whosoever will. Praise God for full salvation for whosoever will. This is a call for everybody that if we have found ourselves falling short in our worship, in our evangelism, in our edification, in our lifestyle, in our thoughts, if we're not doing what Jesus calls us to do, if we have fallen short of his glory in any way, shape, or form, this is our opportunity not to report what we have done, but to repent for what we have done confess our faults and then seek the prayers of your brethren and today we will pray for you and we will pray with you that God will forgive you and then we can work together in perfect harmony and fellowship to accomplish the will of our Lord wherever you are this morning make a wise hearted decision while together we 